Okay. And welcome everybody to Digital Literacy and Citizenship. Uh, this is one of our article and app offerings um, from the Light Center, our monthly reading club. Um, as you know, those of us, uh, those of you who have joined me uh, in previous months this year, we have a monthly reading club. Uh, we are alternating the times. Um, sometimes we offer them once a month at 11, and then sometimes we offer them alternating months at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So thank you everyone for joining. Looks like we've got a few more folks coming in. Welcome, welcome. So as you know, or you may not know, uh, this is an ongoing offering from the Light Center. Um, our aim is to share at least one article and one app or more monthly in this engaging series that's part of our 2024 professional development initiatives. Uh, and of course, I always like to start off with a please, please, please open up the survey, even if you don't have time to make, do it right now. Um, or you want to do it at the end, you'll have that tab open. Uh, please do share your experiences. Let us know if you like this offering, if you want to continue to have these discussions in 2025. We are having some conversations now uh, about those offerings, so please do um, always complete that survey. Your feedback is so invaluable to us and your engagement is always appreciated. Uh, so who is here today? I think I took out the housekeeping slide, but feel free to unmute yourself or introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, your name, your college, how long you've been with Westcliff University, if you want to pop it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, let's all get to know each other. I've got a couple of new names here. Who is iPhone 2? You can change your name if you need some help with that. Let me know. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Joni Mitchell. I am the Professional Development Specialist in the Light Center. Unmute, pop in the chat. Dr. Austin, brand new to the School of Business. Welcome, Dr. Austin. Wonderful to have you here. Who else is here? We got a good showing up. Uh, the month attended does not include August. Dr. Johnson, what are you just, can you unmute? You know, I get confused. <laughs> the survey you just sent us. Oh, it doesn't include August? No. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, How could we do, how can I fix that very quickly? What do you want us to use? Uh, Let's see, let me open it and see if I can open it. See how quickly I can fix it from my side. They're going to want that to be current. Oh, man, it doesn't. Looks like it didn't get revamped here. Let me edit it real quick, and then I'll pop it back in there. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, please pop, it, pop those intros into the chat. Give me two seconds to fix that survey, because it is important. Very, very important for us to have accurate information. Actually, you know, you could do, you could hit July because I can go back and look at the dates. I think it should still sort it by date and I'll just, I'll alter that on the spreadsheet. So click July on that survey. Please do get those done. Uh, meanwhile, we've got a lot of intros in the chats coming through. Uh, Dr. Joseph, uh, welcome, welcome from the School of Business and IT Engineering. Great to have you here. Uh, Dr. Zaragan from the College of Business, uh, new professor from August, 2024. Welcome, great to have you. Uh, let's see, Dr. Tischler, Professor Tischler, College of Ed, um, going on eight years, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Sh oh, Shif Harris, please unmute yourself and tell me how to say your name, because I don't want to mess up. Sharif Zadeh. Sharif Zadeh. Yeah, yeah, you did it very good. Close? Okay, close, good. Very yeah, good. good. <laughs> I, like, I like getting names right. Full-time faculty, six years at Westcliff. Wow, great, wonderful, wonderful to have you here. College of um, Business. College of, oh, College of Business. Excellent, Cousin. excellent. College of Business is well represented today. Um, I mean, it makes sense. I know you guys are the biggest college, but still, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, Professor Smiley, welcome, welcome. Um, Dr. Tiwari, great to have you, College of Business. Uh, more C oh, thank you. Sathya, wonderful to have you here. Feel free to unmute yourself. Started in March. I feels like it was just yesterday. You were in a new new faculty orientation with me. So great to have you here, C-O-T-E. And Dr. Broding, always wonderful to have you. Um, one of our 
curriculum. What are you learning experience designers? Yes, working across many colleges, all colleges really. So wonderful. We're going to have a great conversation today. I do see a face in the audience who did not introduce himself. <laughs> James is smiling because he knows I'm talking to him. Uh, welcome, James, leader of the ASAs on the Irvine campus, um, leader of professional weekend everywhere. From I thought I you were talking about Dr. Johnson. I well, didn't he, see his he intro. Just, he jumped in with the, he jumped, he needs no intro at this point, but he jumped in <laughs> nice with, the, save. with the survey, with the survey of it. So he saved us on the survey. So yes, please do open up that survey. Um, make sure you just click July. I'll, I'll fix that. Um, let's see here. Okay, great. Wonderful to have you all here today. Hopefully we are going to have a great conversation. Who read the article? Raise your hand. I do this with my students sometimes. Raise your hand if you read the article. And one of two things happens. Nobody, a couple people, read, yay. Sometimes I don't get very much hands raised, so it's nice. I'm going to pop that into I don't the know chat. About yay, but I read the article. <laughs> <laughs> yay that you read the article. Yes. You don't, you don't have to say yay to the article just because you read it or didn't read it or maybe you scanned it. Uh, I'm going to pop that into the chat for you all here so that you have access to that link. Feel free to open that up, take a browse at it. Um, be, truth be told, I read it when we first sent this out um, and I haven't taken too much of a look at it since. Uh, but I do want to kind of highlight a couple of things that they talked about. Um, but first, I want to turn it over to you all. This isn't for me to talk. This is for you all to talk and engage. What were your thoughts on the article? Hi. Have in. So Hi, yes. the background music, please. No problem. And, um, my thoughts were that it was a, a timely um, article um, especially because of the state of artificial intelligence in academia. I enjoyed uh, learning about some new, um, I guess, uh, AI tools. Um, like, I didn't know Google had an AI tool. Um, so I enjoyed reading about that. And, you know, a lot of my feelings that I have personally um, about artificial intelligence, it was expressed in the article. So that was nice to see that, um, you know, I'm not alone in that feeling and feeling the ways I'm feeling in regards to the different um, tools that are, that are available, specifically ChatGBT. And that's just my thoughts. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they did talk about, I think this article was still written when, I'm going to do a search right now, when Google was still barred. Is that correct? Anybody who read it? Yeah. So Google's Gemini now, for anybody who doesn't know. The other ones that they talked about, Midjourney I've seen a few times. Obviously, ChatGPT is the big dog um, still in the yard. In case anybody doesn't feel that way, please let me know. It's the one that all my students are still using. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> Dr. Johnson, Google, Gemini, George Washington picks. I've actually used that now with students. We'll talk about that, um, how we are, how we can really bring some of these concerns to light with our students, aside from don't plagiarize. We know that that's always a concern, um, but there are definitely other concerns and opportunities with AI. Any other thoughts on the article? Or our questions? The article, the article realm never really, get, you know, as usual, they don't get into the, the ramifications. I mean, it talks about uh, the Canadian schools, um, the, their DMLF framework that uh, students need to Search for information and then evaluate, authenticate, authenticate, and critique the sources. I mean, you know that's not happening. Uh, they they mentioned some other part about uh, uh, there's just there's too much de depend almost dependability on AL being the right answer. There's no real evaluations, and, and and they really didn't get into the bias programming that goes into it. So it it's um, it's not looked at skeptically like it should be. That's that's the problem. I mean, it's not that it, it can be an excellent tool, but people take it as gospel, and including the authors of this article. Yeah, this is like a reoccurring theme we've seen with a lot of our AI articles. Has anybody seen any content? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be from an academic journal, but even when I read, because um, I read like a lot of faculty focus and 
um, OLC, online learning consortiums had some interesting things around AI and engagement in the classroom and active learning. And I still, you know, your, your voice kind of rings in my head, Dr. Johnson, because it, it, there is that missing that concept of bias, bias in the algorithm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the- It's the George Washington picks as, a, as, as an excellent, Washington. easy example. I'm just letting um, everybody but, Google that one. I'm just letting everybody Google that one in their own and, time. And the other thing is they, they just scratched the surface about the hallucinations because it actually yeah. admits it lies. Uh, it actually yeah. admits that it because it doesn't have a conscious to know that it's not a good thing per yeah. se. And uh, the the um, the other part was interesting was they talked about the teacher free zones. I mean, this is kind of like what Dr. Flores' vision was was to replace professors. So it's um, I, I don't know it seemed it seemed like this was written still in its nascent stages, but yeah. again, this is the common theme we see throughout these articles that they. They just want to really touch on the good stuff and they kind of gloss over some of the problems as well as how to use it really effectively without, you know, while addressing the ethical considerations. Yeah, they kind of lay out the framework, but they don't tell you. I mean, I didn't feel like the article told me what the framework ought to be. Um, they mentioned, you know, having that agile framework, understanding the adaptability of it. Um, which of course we're seeing, right? Where new tools are coming out all the time. Um, you know, we, I think as educators have a very strong role in, in learning those tools and learning about them. Uh, anybody who talks to me knows that I feel, you know, about that. It's come up in our PLCs. It's come up in other conversations that I've had with Westcliff faculty. Um, you know, they talked a little bit, I'm trying to find the line here. Uh, there's been a lack of educators, lack of teachers in the literature, right? A lot of the, the conversations around AI in the classroom has been dominated by computer scientists. And that's, you know, they're not saying that that's a bad thing or a good thing. They're just saying like, we, we're, it's missing our voice, right? When we're talking about AI in education, it's missing the educator voice. Is that something that you all are experiencing? Or do you feel like, know it's pretty well balanced. I, we have a lot of COB here, a lot of COTE folks here. Um, what are the conversations you're having either with colleagues or in your communities or with your students, most importantly? Well, in regards to my students, um, I have been telling them, especially when I notice a high percentage I, you know, I have the conversation with them. I see how they're utilizing the tool or, or if they're utilizing the tool, but a lot of times they're utilizing the tool. I express the need for them to, you know, reference it, that you're utilizing something that's not your own, you know, your own original thought. You're putting something into a tool and you're having it reformat for you. So that's not, that's a problem um, academic wise. And then I also, um, so I suggest that they reference it. And I also suggest that they write, they they stay away from it right now specifically because we don't know where we're going with it um, in you know, the academic field. So you utilizing this tool so heavily might put your, you know, your career, you know, in jeopardy. So to really utilize and, and try to, you know, reference the different things that they're using outside of the chat GPT. And if they want to go back and do that, you know, upload or send to me, you know, a chat GPT version of something that they wrote, you know, um, and to utilize the writing labs and the professors while we're here and we can give them the feedback that they need in order for them to learn how to do and research correctly. I like that, um, especially the utilized professors. I think we're, I'm going to, I want to address the career thing um, as well, because I think that's, that's a major part of digital literacy. Um, and I think one thing the article did talk about was, you know, having that learner teacher sourced approach, like getting your students input and having those conversations. And I know sometimes at Westcliff, it seems like we don't really have time for that. I think the impression I get from faculty, mind you, I am not on campus, so you all please chime in here and let me know, um, is that a lot of times there isn't a lot of time 
right? So how do we have those conversations? How do we frame those conversations? And then of course, something we don't have at Westcliff, which is a unified digital competency framework. Um, how practical are these frameworks at Westcliff? Um, let's see, Dr. Johnson said, assumes that people will use it ethically. Yeah, a lot of these articles do. And it assumes that AI is correct. If any source was wrong as AI, we would dismiss it completely. It's less accurate than Wikipedia, yet we rightfully do not let students cite. Uh, students simply do not want the article do not want what the article says. Students need to search for information and then evaluate, authenticate, and critique sources and that information uh, contained within them. That comes back to where we do have some agency at Westcliff, I think, though, where how are we designing activities where we can give students that opportunity, or are we? Again, I know you all have uh, objectives, learning objectives, department objectives that you have to get to. Um, Professor Chaser said, good point, Dr. Smiley. I cannot talk uh, as I am commuting home on a public transportation, but I should start with having the conversation with students on the first day. Ah, a great point, Dr. Tischler. Day one, day one, there's, I mean, there's no point now in, just my opinion, sorry, I teach at other campuses, so you all know I have very strong opinions about what happens in the classroom, but like, um, I literally talked to a professor about three weeks ago who did not talk to students about anything AI related until something came up plagiarized and she was able to prove it. And so she missed all this time um, over the course of her summer class to engage in conversations because, you know, which of course just opening that door to have the conversation and say, hey, we kind of know you're gonna use it. So if that's, if, however you want to approach it, please chime in here and tell me how you approach it. but. For me, I don't see the benefit of pretending that students are not going to use it. Um, we do have the policy. We, you know, the Turnitin policy, we do try to uphold that. Um, but yeah, offering, motivating, and promoting the Writing Center, that's a great, and it's specific college resource, that's a great approach, uh, approach for Westcliff University. We know that there are resources, and, and again, back to what Dr. Smiley was saying, while your professors are there, while you have access to the writing center, right? These services that you are paying for heavily, really expensive. Um, James Jones said, what would ethical use of AI look like for students? Um, Dr. Johnson. Uh, step one, Dr. Siley says, step uh, is to admit that you are using it. Talk about the use of it. Dr. Johnson said, I even have students use AI uh, for, DOS in which students, what's DOS? This is why I just need you to unmute. I'm a little tongue tied this morning still. Um, subject Sorry, personal DQs. experience. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes sense. It's like, what? That makes sense. It's like, oh, what's DOS? That's very specific COB talk. Now, DQs, which is subject for personal experience, give me an example. Yeah. I mean, though, that's some of the conversation. So I teach a lot of asynchronous classes, and that's one of the ongoing conversations I have with students. I cannot think for you. It cannot give examples for you. And it'll often at the end of your paragraph tell you how crucial something is. This is crucial because blah, 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 blah. Or this highlights the need for blah, 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 blah. Thank you so much. That didn't answer the question, right? Are they even reading the question? And so again, this goes back to pulling our students into the conversation. Thinking about maybe our own, if we don't have an institutional framework, uh, we have an institutional policy, just to be clear, very aware. But if we don't have an institutional framework, at least having a classroom framework. But let me take a look here. I think I did my slides in the right order. So I borrowed this from another institution and we, I have permission to use these details, but not to use the actual graphics. So I threw a graphic together so you can have it. Um, digital literacy, what we're talking about there. And this hopefully will help you think about as you design your classes, technical proficiency, right? This is our students need tech, technical proficiency, right? They, they have to have opportunities to use the devices, software, and internet effectively, effectively. That's the key. Information literacy. Now, I like the little logo of the books there, although most students are not doing their reading from books. I um, actually don't know too many <laughs> new students who are reading books these days. Um, but the ability to find, evaluate, and use information appropriately. Uh, communication. Anybody teach their students how to write emails? 
I have a whole policy on and and I and I've talked to program chairs and deans and the ones that I've spoken to are fully in support of help your students write emails. This is part of digital literacy. Can you communicate clearly? Do not send me a line of text talk. Hey, why is my grade? Question mark. <laughs> yes, I've had that email. Media literacy, understanding critically analyzing digital media content. I'm biased, I teach a class on that. Um, but any way you can incorporate social media and things that they're seeing in the media, um, typically through social media, right? Where most people get their news now um, in your courses. Would love to hear some examples. Creative production, leveraging digital tools to create and share content. That's where you guys come in with the Kahoot or Mentimeter or some of the other tools um, that we can use to help our students engage through technology. Dr. Johnson said, borrowed, LOL, good artist, copy, great artist, steal. Steve Jobs, the great part about the quote is he stole it from Picasso. <laughs> I like that. But understanding that some students are, they're coming from cultures where that's actually what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to copy the master. Uh, Dr. Tisher says the professor is supposed to supply a reply to students. It is a good opportunity to follow up in these cases with additional questions. Dr. Tischler, I know you're communicating. Please be safe. But um, what kind of questions do you ask in your DQs when you see this? I get pretty stumped here. Um, I, I tend to take the conversation offline. Um, I'd love to hear some more on that. I'm going to start calling on people, y'all. But before I do, the other half of this is digital citizenship, right? And this is something that we are showing. When we're talking about plagiarism, when we're talking about citing, when we're talking about future career, like Dr. Smiley brought up, when you're talking about legalities, our students need to understand that there's a thing called digital citizenship that is getting bigger and bigger in many industries. The ethical behavior, understanding, practicing ethical behavior online. And, and again, these are abbreviated from a much longer document that I took them from, um, including respecting others, recognizing the impact on one's actions, right? You can't just go online and mouth off and not have ramifications. Anybody watch the Olympics? It's one of the examples I use with my students, that poor boxer who came from a country where what people were saying about her online could get her family in a lot of trouble. Google it if you don't know or private message me. Digital etiquette, practicing good manners and respectful behavior in online interactions is another one. We know we grew up in the era of Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, but professionally and legally and ethically there are steps that our students need to be aware of. Safety and security, protecting information and understanding cybersecurity threats. We have quite a few teachers in here who teach in cybersecurity. Um, how much do your students know? How much do they need to learn? And then of course, legal awareness, understanding and, and adhering to laws and regulations. We might not get into the nitty gritty of the laws, even just letting our students know there are laws. There are things that can come back to bite you hard, um, especially where AI use is concerned, right? Copyright, intellectual property rights, saying that you wrote something, getting information from an AI source that ends up being wrong. Um, and then, of course, being aware of their digital footprint. Yes, when you go for that big job making 150000 a year in tech and they Google you, and you have a fully open um, Facebook or Instagram where they find out about that party, that bachelor party that you went to uh, 10 years ago, that can impact you. <laughs> Happen to an actual student of mine. Um, I read an interesting article not too long ago that, that companies um, are using that earlier and earlier in the hiring process. And I've worked with some individuals in like career development who had to like really 
start pulling their clients aside and saying, hey, this is what I found when I Googled you, right? Professor Titchler said, it depends on the case. Back to talking about DQs with students, um, teachers who are teaching, I try to encourage them to share examples, wisdom from their experience. For pre-service teachers, I try to have them offer examples of how they have seen it as students or how they might incorporate X into their future desired level classroom. Yeah, getting into the specifics, right? Um, no problem about the noise on the Metro. Appreciate you sharing those examples, right? And, and also, I just want to point out um, the importance of knowing those details about your students. How are you learning? How much do you know about your students? How are you getting to know them in order to be able to have those very like personalized conversations in a DQ? Sorry, I'm getting a notification here. I just need to close that out. James Jones says, using AI to brainstorm ideas can be very helpful in finding relevant personal examples and help them to reflect on it. But it sounds like your students are stopping once they have a product from ChatGPT. Yeah, that's how many people is that happening to? <laughs> they get that first initial paragraph, copy paste. That's the end of it, right? They don't know how to engage. Um, they don't know how to investigate, evaluate a little bit like what they, a little bit of what they talked about in the article. Dr. Johnson, the chat said, behavior is molded by fear, uh, whether we want to admit it or not. If there is no fear of consequences of one actions, behaviors, we will not change. Behaviors will not change. Thousands of years of history demonstrate this. There has been has to be some sort of fear and consequences of using AI unethically. It's amazing how many of my students' behaviors change after they get a zero for this. If they continue to get A's for their work, then there's no reason for them to change their behaviors. Absolutely. James asked, do you have a zero poly tolerate poly policy for AI? Johnson said, yes, I go into great detail on the first day of class about how to use it and how not to use it and why they cannot use it. I explain how the detectors are behind. We are already seeing some changes in the detectors. Yes, we are. That's one of the good things. Um, I, honestly, I honestly believe that that's going to be, we're already seeing things like what's AI generated versus AI enhanced. And as the, as the detectors get better, it'll be easier for us. Because I don't think anybody, or I, I don't know any professors that have a problem, for instance, of using, like we, there are schools that provided Grammarly, but because the detectors were behind, we couldn't tell the difference between somebody just copying and pasting from ChatGPT or using Grammarly or using a translating tool that they all just came up 100%. So well, for now, you can't use these. And until and as the detectors get better, and you'll be able to use writing enhancement, because again, that's not so much the issue. The issue is being able to differentiate it. Uh, and they're already starting to. I know that Grammarly, I know all the folks I've spoke to at Grammarly are all adjunct teachers. So they, they have the same pains that we do. And I know that they are working on something that's supposed to be coming out pretty quick. And uh, others are working on that stuff as well. You know, like when we, you know, when you use regular turn it in, you have, you have the different colors and you got this from here mm -hmm. and this from here and this from here and things like that and how that comes up. Um, I'm just curious, do you know, do, do uh, you folks know how books come up on regular turn it in? Because books are not detected on regular turn it in. So what happens in regular turn it in is let's say uh, James Jones writes a book and Joni copies and pastes. If she's the first person, she gets away with it. But then anybody else who copies and pastes, it's going to say, well, you stole this from Joni. And that's just how that detector works as far as books go. And there's just, there's just always going to be, but we see the different colors. And eventually we'll see if the detectors get better, it'll be easier for us to be able to differentiate between writing enhanced and you use this to help your writing versus this is completely copied and pasted from from an AI mod from from AI. And I think as that develops, that'll just make a lot of the questions kind of go away. But right now they're just behind because it's such a nascent technology. Yeah, that's that's interesting about the books. I did not know about that. 
Um, actually, honestly, I just never thought about it. Uh, and so I never thought to check that. And I think that is there anybody in here who feels that it's really important not to just rely on the Turnitin? I know that that's part of the policy at Westcliff in terms of actually um, marking it as plagiarism and reporting students for plagiarism. But what are some other methods that you use when you're reading your students' work or, or DQs? Um, I don't know if Turnitin has fully gone away, but I did hear that Turnitin was going away for DQs. Um, oh, um, yes. Go ahead. Oh, hello. I heard somebody unmute. Oh, Dr. Zergian, I can't hear you. You're not unmuted. Ask to unmute. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Yes, great. My name is uh, Arshak. Uh, I'm from Russia, actually, with 16 years of experience. And let me, like, a little bit tell, tell about my experience. And uh, AI today, uh, very it becoming to very strong and it's very very important to try to identify if the work or the answers get by ai or students and in what way i was uh, trying to work just to try to talk with students if you have even the <clears throat> answer which right and there is no uh no matter if this uh, was done by AA or students, I was just trying to look if how, in what way the student can uh, explain and to understand this uh, the answer, the situation, and in what way it's, uh, it's he's gonna to use in in real life. Let's say we if we talking about the strategy, he, uh, the students bring me the all answers. It's very very beautiful. Maybe it's copy pasted from internet or uh, AI. But for me, it was important in what way he is gonna to use this uh, knowledge. Uh, let's say we in innovative management was opening, uh, discussing a lot, a lot of business ideas, and for me, it was important to understand if the students have their own ideas in what way he is gonna to uh, open his own business, uh, in what way to go through this analytical steps to evidence his hypothesis and go back and understand if this business idea is going to fly or not in the real market. So in this interaction process, there were no chances to use the AI or other system. And it was able to understand if the students, uh, like they understand or they just uh, copy the material and uh, forgetting just Mark or in what way they they gonna to use this material? It was more important for me, and in this way, this approach uh, showed showed me the way the students are thinking and working, and uh, I I was able to see if the this uh, material was prepared by students or somebody else. Thank you. I think. Thank I, you. Sounds like a heavy lift, <laughs> but it's important, right? It's important that we're having these conversations that we're understanding our stu where our students are thinking, where their thinking comes from. Um, certainly if you're talking about a major project, it sounded like you were describing kind of a major assignment like designing a business. Um, they also get really great experience if they're gonna go on for, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Johnson, but they have to defend their dissertation if they're going on for a DBA or I don't know what they, what do they do at the MBA area, the MBA level, Dr. Johnson or anybody else from COB here? What is no, that? Like? I, I, I mentioned, though I did mention to you before that I, there already is, I know, I know of one case in Washington where they did their defense and all of you who've done your doctoral defenses know that it's basically almost a rubber stamp in the sense that you know what you wrote. And this uh, student couldn't really answer the questions on his own dissertation. So here he got through he, all his school, all his education, got his dissertation approved. And then they had to drop him from the program because they then put it detector and it was like almost 90% AI written. And they're not even reading what they're, what they're, yeah. what they're getting from, from AI. They're just 
it's the answer again they're they're falling back on this is the this is like uh like gospel yeah they get them up yeah and i'm sure that's that's just one i know i'm sure there's been a lot more yeah I have a few friends that work in different areas of recruiting and it's the same thing they they're getting beautiful cover letters now and gorgeous resumes and they go to do an interview and person has no idea what's on their resume no idea what it says or they can't explain it oh i see this role oh yes i did that uh what did that look like they can't explain it so i think those conversations are really important um going over to the chat dr johnson said when i've spoken to students directly i've never had a student not admit they use chat gpt or another ai tool that's awesome i've actually had students <laughs> full face lie to me but and it, it's like and again, doing that same um, test that Arshak talked about, that same just having the conversation, just being open and having the conversation and, and having them not be able to explain what's on the page. Um, uh, Dr. Money said, I also scan, or I scan the documents, uh, metadata, and also use Google Draftback in addition to turn it in. Does everybody here know what Google Draftback is? I don't, but I don't teach with Google Docs. Dr. Money, can you unmute? Do you mind? Are you busy? Are you fly on the wall today? I'm uh, driving right now, so it's a little bit. Uh, that's okay. Google Dropback is just a way that um, it's an extension for Google Docs that takes a document and just does a video replaying of its um, how it was constructed by the student. I mean, you can just go back through Google Edit to see if a student has done a large amount of cut and paste um, on their document. But Google Draftback is much faster. It creates a video. And instead of like going through a ton of edits, um, Google Draftback can do in 20 seconds what it would normally take me 20 minutes to do. Nice. Yeah, that metadata, um, I've seen some uh, like demonstrations with that. It's no joke. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely having something uh, a little bit faster and in the form of a video, because you could even show the student if you wanted to have that open up a conversation. I don't know if this is a dialogue that uh, you all are interested in having with your students. Um, I'm very open with my students, so um, but I've had a lot of support with that. Uh, and again, it's always from a place of like, because I want you to understand that, you know, part of your digital literacy is understanding that. <laughs> where your information is coming from and where it can be wrong. So very helpful. Great tool. I'm going to look into that one. Um, yeah, to, turn it in doesn't give you a lot of the history, uh, obviously. It just highlights and it's so important to learn how to use turn it in properly. So if you need some help with that, please do reach out to us in the Light Center. Um, we do have some really good resources. We know that turn it in is changing and things are changing in GAP. Um, but we really want to work with faculty on just making sure that you have some understanding of Turnitin, the limitations um, of that percentage, right? The percentage is not perfect. Um, and, and again, the conversations that it can, can build. Dr. Austin said, such great insights on making meaningful distinctions and intentional engagement. Yeah. It, it's so important to um, be able to have those conversations. And I know how annoying it is when you do get students who just copy and paste the whole thing in there. Um, if anybody teaches like first year students, uh, it's the worst. <laughs> but I'm an A student, I know. And congrats, but this is not A quality work, you know. Um, let me click on here. A couple more big conversations, kind of related to the article, but also related to, um, you know, Again, making those, I like that meaningful distinctions, like Dr. Austin mentioned there. The article mentions that AI, uh, issues like AI generated content and deep fakes. Um, how do you address concerns? Um, and again, I'm talking to you folks. Uh, well, actually anybody who, I was gonna say COTE, but really anybody who students are like generating like content other than papers. Um, you know, if you're doing anything with media or, uh, you know, I saw this teacher do like a really cool thing with Dolly with images and Dolly ChatGPT's image generator is really not great. <laughs> like it'll mash up faces and 
words, you know, and be, will be spelled wrong and inc incorrectly and, and all kinds of things. And, um, but really like things like deep fakes, accuracy, you know, what are there general conversations that you're having with your students? Um, and then also this was just a point of can, uh, just curiosity for me. The article suggests a unified approach to digital literacy. We know we don't have that at Westcliff. Um, I don't even know if that's a goal that we would want to have because all of our colleges are so different and you all do so many different things. Um, but are there collaborations now that you're familiar with? Um, and what are the potential benefits of cha or challenges of adopting a unified digital literacy framework? So a couple of questions around some of the major points brought up from the articles. Are you having conversations with your students about not just their work, but like <laughs> just AI, what AI does in general? Um, my, so one of my students actually sent me a link to, it was a um, voice version of ChatGPT that actually overtook the girl's voice and replicated it. Um, and I was like, this has to be fake. This has to be fake. And then I started researching it and it was totally real. Um, and it was very freaky. Dr. Money said, it's hilarious. My 16 year old created a whole graphic novel about Amish communists trying to take over the world. That's awesome. What app did, did your 16 year old use? <laughs> um, James would like a copy. Yes. <laughs> and, and he'll share it with me. So if you just, we'll, put, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for it. Um, no, I think that, well, James will pay for it. He's, he's on campus. Uh, I think that there are, there are fun things that we can do. Right. And, and again, like, you know, what's the, what's the line between like, okay, creativity versus the AI's creativity uh, versus this concept of deep fakes, or it's just creating something that either voice or image um, I've heard a lot from a couple different artist communities about concerns of AI. Are these things that come up in any of your classes or are you thinking about your students' literacy in these areas? Dr. Johnson said, they seem to have a good understanding of the flaws with AI. We just have to admit that we have a percentage in the grad program that simply do not care about that. The ones who really show the only reason they are here is because of the visa. They could not care less about the degree. Yeah. Well, we've talked about student motivations before. Remember, I want the grade. Remember I want that the I was, in a previous uh, in a previous meeting that we had, I had asked students about what they're going to do with their degree. Yes. And like one student sure says, I'm going to fold it up into quarters and put it under my table. So I can level it out. That's all he said. That's literally what he said. Other people said really couldn't care less. We just have the percentage of that. Unlike other universities in which many of us have been associated. And these are the ones that may know the flaws, they know all that. And like a lot of things, like it's the small, it's the small, the 10% spend night to take 90% of our time. They're the ones that uh, cause us the, the most work. And that, that's just a, a reality, especially in the grad program. Do you ever see that student anymore, Dr. Johnson? Because I would I would love to like find that student on LinkedIn and be like, no, 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 don't post this degree on there. <laughs> You've ever, you just wanted it for your fridge. Um, but I'm, I'm special that way. Um, but I think I've actually never oh, had it, said it was interesting because it wasn't like a one-on-one. -on -one. This was something yeah, you said in class. Group. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I find it hard to believe that like the majority of students are putting in any effort, let alone showing up to class. And that's the extent of their, right? One of these days they're going to want, hopefully, they're going to want to be paid for that DBA or that MBA. But student motivations are a problem, right? It's kind of hard to get students to think critically about digital literacy or deep fakes or anything else if they're there for an A. I'm here because my degree program requires it. Well, and the ones that really want to just get better, they do use it ethically. They do know how to use it correctly and they do use it as a tool. So that's where, that's where so many of these articles are taking that as the given. That these are, and you know, like if you're doing, if you're a professional researcher, or let's say 
your, um, uh, let's say your doctor money, you're being paid 200,000, 250,000 working in Chile to do research. And all the people that work for PAs and grad students and so forth, they want to follow, follow suit. They're not the issue. Right. They're not, that's not really where the problems are, are, are lining up. It's these, it's, it's the situations with which we come across and it's not all the students, but it's again, it's the ones that we have to spend a lot of time on. And, um, yeah. When you think about how many people, let's say, let's face it, you get an F in a class. It's usually because you're not turning in work. Really, I mean, more than anything else, you're just not, you're not giving much of an effort. And when you look at the average class, how many, how many people, we have the, we have the usual, some standing students who continue to get better. And we, we have an interesting, we don't have a real normal bell curve. I mean, ours looks almost inverse, <laughs> inverse of that. The very few C's in my class, for instance, so a lot of A's, a lot of B's, a lot of, a lot of F's. F's, yeah. I had a student a um, couple months ago, and I was so happy because it seemed like he had learned how to, like, I knew he was still using AI. And I, I really try to stay away from, like, don't use it. Um, I do try to let students know that it's problematic because of the generic thinking, you know, um, results. Uh, for a couple of uh, live activities, we, because I'm fully remote, um, we do go in and, you know, engage with the tool. And so I actually thought that's what he had done. And I was like, oh, good, because, you know, I was like, right in the department and doing all the paperwork for all of the plagiarism, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, it turns out that he was actually just going into another section of the discussion and taking other students' posts and then rerunning them through AI tools and then actually using them. And I didn't catch it for like three days, like for the first half of the week in the discussion. And he had done like four posts and I was like, oh my gosh, he's, I, I can tell, I can tell he's still using AI. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't write this way, but his ideas are getting more concrete. His, his paragraphs are getting more organized. This is great. Now he's just using it unethically in another way. So it is, it's time consuming and it's frustrating for that reason. Does having a framework help? Those of you who say from day one, I talk to my students. In the chat, Dr. Johnson said it would be interesting to see the curve on grading in the classes. You, um, you all know it has is nothing like a bell curve yet. Does anybody feel like they have a bell curve? Like they have a pretty solid, like. Well, when I was in college, Ed, they were teachers were encouraged to almost follow that line. You know, a certain percentage. Yeah, grade on percentage the curve. So forth. Yeah, I mean, and in fact, what the, some teachers would do is. If let's say it was a really hard test, the average score was 55. That 55 mm -hmm. became the became an 80. And never all right. the scores were, were kind of adjusted because they couldn't give a whole class B's and F's. But that's how mm -hmm. that's how they would they would with all the classes. And for the most part, they weren't perfect bell curves, but they're a lot closer than what we have here. I said ours is almost like inverse bell curves. I give fewer C's than anything else. I know that. Yeah, what about you like all? At the extremes. They're excellent writers. Do you feel that way? Like, do you do in class writing and compare? I, I no, I'm joking. I was like, I think that's actually harder. To... You muted too fast, so I couldn't tell. So I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I, I concur with a lot of um Dr. Johnson's sentiments. But specifically, like when you're grading on that rubric that we have, you know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. difficult to give them zeros, right? Unless you know off rip, like okay, this this is not their work. So a lot of times, even when you know when you're reading it, this is like, okay, this is too perfect. You can't give them a zero if the other criteria is more like technically they're, you know, they're satisfying. So that's like the only problem that I have um, in regards to like the the student grading portion. 
Dr. Brody knows I'm about to come to her, our resident oh, curriculum yeah. designer. Well, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Smiley, would you, uh, in, a, in a class of 20, about overall grades, how many A's, how many B's, how many C's, how many D's, how many F's, what would be your curve, if you will, for a class of 20 A's. students? I have a lot of A's. I'll say I'm, I have about mm, 13, 14 A's. Very little, very little F's. Mostly F's is like you're not turning turning things in at all. And then C, I don't think I have C's really. B, C, D. Would you say right? you have more, would you, do you have more F's than C's? Yes. That's interesting. Dot Oni. Okay, you have to tell me your name because I feel like I'm just going to butcher that. See your comment there in the chat. The rubrics are designed for B's and A's. I would love to hear more on that. I know we don't have that much more time, but I'm very curious about that. Yeah, this is Dot Oni. How are you? Hello. I don't want to don't speak. I just listen mostly. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, the way the rubrics are designed, they're just designed for A's and B's. When you look through it, uh, no matter where you what you check, you're gonna find out they're gonna end up with B's. Okay, students will get an A. People that are just kind of trying to struggle probably get a B. That's just the way I see it. That's interesting. I was about to throw it uh, at Mary just to ask about um, rubric design. Are you all going to your colleges? Yep, she beat me to it. There it is in the in the. Are you going to your program chairs and saying these rubrics do not align with the current state of education? Right, we're not we're not <laughs> yeah, looking at digital been, literacy. No, I mean really, like we've been really, putting that in the uh, yeah, we've been putting that in the uh, force feedback for a couple of years and nothing's changed. Yeah, I, and that, I even and have like, I even have an error in a class where two of the weeks twelve and fourteen should have been swapped. And I put that a year almost two years ago. Still nothing's changed. I mean, I know it takes time. I, I experienced that too, but I think that it's really important feedback um, for uh, even to go to your program chair. Yeah, uh, Dr. Brody said faculty can reach out to their program chairs with requests that rubrics revise, and then the program chairs can put in a request to have those revised specifically around this, specifically around digital literacy, AI literacy. When things, I need a rubric that says if something is vague, it's worth very much fewer points, not sort of kind of B level, right? Like Dot Oni said, like being able to say like, okay, the level of generic language here, which is probably from AI, um, needs to be somewhere over here in the, in the lower range, in the C range. Um, James says, what role, if any, does AI have in the future of the information retrieval and creation process? You want to unmike James? We got a few minutes left. I want to hear more about that. Uh, I was just reviewing the abstract for this article, and uh, that seemed to be kind of a central idea here. And I think that that is kind of what the conversation is uh, ultimately supposed to be about: is um, what role do we want AI to play in the future? Uh, Dr. Johnson has a very strong uh, opinion, I think, on a zero tolerance policy, which does seem to be the most effective, but it seems like it's a tool that's too enticing not to use. And so do we advocate for responsible use? Do we uh, try to determine, uh, to me, it seems like there is a missing step in getting students to switch from, hey, the AI is this great tool that can do, <laughs> make my life so much easier. I don't have to do the homework in terms of, and it, changing that and saying it's a good way to get started and to refine ideas but where does that where does the work become your own and so uh it's i don't know i mean i i think dr johnson's got a great point about um having a strict policy which certainly deters students from using it and that might really be the best solution but i don't know I think that that's the question I wanted to pose, I guess, to the other professors is uh, what role, if any, does AI play in 
Is it brainstorming? Is it uh, uh, refining, looking for um, weak points in our own arguments? Because uh, there are a lot of one of the weaknesses of AI, and I think a lot of people can contest to this, is uh, it, it produces false information, misinformation, inaccurate information very frequently. Um, there's countless examples of that. So, however, it does help to um, uh, to analyze our own ideas. So sometimes I will start giving it my own ideas and asking it to help me to develop and build on it. Uh, and that's that's been a really helpful function of it. So I, I hate the idea of throwing out the baby with the bathwater here, yeah. but it's hard, you know, a zero tolerance policy is probably going to be the most effective, but I want to leave that to faculty it's, to decide. Yeah, I, no, it's very think, frustrating. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I think, yeah, the zero policy, the zero tolerance policy is the best, but we have to kind of, you know, uh, pair that with, uh, you pair with uh, uh, adequate training, right? Training for the student on the, you know, the responsible use of this tool. Again, this is not going away. So we just need to find out how we can just make sure they're doing the right thing. When, with our student, we all know they modify their behavior based on you know, our feedback, right? If you know you're gonna get a zero, the next time you're gonna think twice before you do it. So if we have a policy that's across board, that every instructor is doing the same thing, I think, it's, like, it's going to take a while, but I think we'll get there, you know, from the, with that approach. That's just my perspective. I'd like to piggyback on a conversation um, that Dr. Jane uh, brought up. Um, sorry, Jones. I'm sorry. Um, no I, doctorate here. Just James. <laughs> Simple hey, James. Hey, Jones. <laughs> hey, James. So I'm one for... Um, specifically with my brother, like he's a business owner and he's doing his PhD. He has a thousand different ideas running through his head. And he calls me oftentimes and wants to, you know, ask me questions about what he's doing his um, doctoral in. And honestly, I have no idea. Like I can't, I can't help you streamline your thoughts because I don't know enough about your topic or your field to give you sufficient information. So I agree with you when it comes to getting like the outline, right? Because even though, the outline using using the tool because even though that might not be exactly what you are thinking or how you can um format your paper it gives you a a genre where you know it helps with it helps with your thoughts it helps you put your thought in better organization and that makes sense so oh, yeah, yeah i agree with you about totally. that Yeah, it's it's because it helps me to think as well when I can kind of have that uh, almost like a banter with chat GPT or something and I can start bouncing ideas off of it. And uh, and like you said, kind of ironing out some of those details uh, and getting an outline. But having to make that switch has to be a really intentional switch from, hey, I'm just going to take what I got from chat GPT and and to like actually producing something. So, yeah, we're running out of time here. Um, these were the final questions. Uh, Professor Oni brought it up. Uh, James, we didn't quite get to this part, but yeah, how are we doing this? I do find that with Westcliff faculty, um, you all, the uh, first of all, the frustration is real. Frustration over the plagiarism, frustration over the laziness, frustration over the lack of motivation. I That is very real and totally validating that. Um, but the agency is in your live classes, right? So reach out to us at the Light Center. Let us help you with your course design. Let us help you with classroom ideas, active learning techniques. Even at the grad level, um, there's lots of that you can do. Um, as a reminder, please do this survey. Um, I'm sorry, there's no August on it. I will fix this. Uh, not right now, just mark July and I'll mark off where the old ones go. So please do complete that survey. When you do this survey, it really helps us bring programming to you and bring more conversations to our faculty where we look for solutions, where we, we share our ideas. A um, couple more things coming up. Uh, one this month, 30 minute tip of the month uh, is coming up on Thursday. Please do come to our DIE, um, uh, as the Faculty Senate DIE committee is going to be doing a couple of webinars for webinars for us uh, on September 12th, 8 a.m. and 12 noon. You could join us for either one of those. You should already have the calendar invite. And we are um, not 
just talking about AI, but individualization of instruction is our next PLC for fall one. If you wish to join, please do this survey here. There's a link in this survey. We still have it open, so you should be able to do that, or you could always reach out to us. Um, diversity, inclusion, and equity um, in higher ed. Oh, I just saw. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, sharing ideas. Let's continue to have these conversations. Let's continue to share our experiences. Um, we know we have a special group of students here at Westcliff, and so it's always great to get together and share some ideas. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. <laughs>